verse 9, where Jesus apparently says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Are you aware of this verse? No. Matthew chapter 5. So the definition there is given to you that a one who does peace, but who does works peace or represents God, he is known as a son of God. This is further supplemented in Romans chapter 8, where Paul says, those which, who are led by the Spirit of God, they are known as sons of God. Now, having established these two definitions, we look further into uh, establishing, well, who else are referred to as sons of God, based upon my explanation? And we see many others. In Luke chapter 3, verse 38, Adam is referred to as the son of God. So it's a widespread title for those who represent God. They are given that title. They carry, it's not a literal title. Now the term God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God. Now the God the Son is a, is a term never used for Jesus in the entire Bible, or for that matter for anybody else either. Nobody is referred to with this title. These were, you know, in Christian history, these were late, later concepts that developed about who Jesus was. Like he was, you know, people used to, after he left the earth, people were, who was this man? What was his position? It was based upon this understanding that um, later he was eulogized as the second person of the Trinity, when the man himself made no such claim. Now, you're an intelligent young lady, and ch check this verse out from the Gospels. G what we say as Muslims is let Jesus speak for himself. Don't assume something for him. In John 17, 3, Jesus says the following, For this is eternal life, that they may know you as the only true God, and whom you have sent, the messenger Jesus Christ. So Jesus is saying, you are the only true God, and I am your messenger whom you have sent. I get that. I get that. But it also does say that Jesus is the Son of God, and no one can come to the Father except through Him. So why doesn't it say except through Abraham, or except through Adam, or except through you as a son, or like we're all sons of God? Fantastic. Now, in what you're referring to is John chapter 14. So the exact saying what you made when he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Yeah. No man come to God but by through me. Yeah. So what does he mean by this? So all you've got to do, you know there's a saying, context is king. It's a okay. saying, <laughs> context is king. Okay, so yeah. in order to establish what does a particular saying mean, you've got to read the preceding verses. Mm -hmm. So in John 14, 1, Jesus is, um, being, uh, is um, making mention that in, his far, in God's house, there are many mansions. So he's addressing two people in particular, Philip and Thomas. So it's because these, you know, you're aware probably, the disciples ask Jesus many awkward questions. Yeah. You're aware of this, aren't yeah. you? Sometimes he becomes a bit frustrated with them. You're aware of this, aren't you? Yeah. So when, when, as a result of this, they then to solidify their faith, Jesus says to them that in order for you to get to God, you have to come through me. What does that mean? I am the way. So all he's saying, follow my way. Because he's been sent amongst them, these people have transgressed. They're, they're far away from worshipping God. Outside the religious temples, what's going on? Gambling and all types. So why does he upturn the tables and you know, accuse the Pharisees and the Sadducees of being you vipers and you hypocrites? You're spreading ungodliness even in your... So he said, then he was advising these, you follow my way. And then the life, follow my life's example and the truth. And what is the truth? Jesus says, it, as I said in John 17, 3, how does one gain the hereafter? For this is eternal life, that they may know you as the only true God. And whom you have, so in that John, so all he's basically saying, you've got, to, you've got to go, you've got to follow my way. That's how you get to God, because he's the intermediary between God and mankind. An intermediary in 1 Timothy is that one who acts as the example of how you get to God through Jesus, because he's a select person. So at the time of Moses, the only way for the children of Israel to get through to God would have been through Moses. He was a select person, chosen. God did not speak to every um, you know, uh, person from amongst the children of Israel. He spoke to select people who were the, his representatives. So in that sense, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life, he simply means to follow my way, I give you the, follow my life's example and I speak the truth. That's it. No other meaning to it. It's so strangely, whenever I speak to many Christians, you know, they make this, when they mention this verse, John 14, 6, it's as if to suggest, no man goes through the Father but by through me, and therefore, that's something extraordinary of him. No, 
if you don't examine it carefully, it's just basically saying, follow my way, follow my life's example, and I'll speak the truth to you. Simple as that. There's no connotation, or there's nothing impl implying that he's claiming to be God within that. Does that make sense, my explanation? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So what we say further to this, yeah. is there are many other examples where Jesus says, worship God alone. In Mark chapter 12, verse 28, Jesus, when he's approached by a scribe, the scribe says to Jesus, Teacher, what is the greatest of all commandments? What does Jesus say to him? He says to him, Hear thou, O Israel, your Lord God, the Lord is one. And the term Lord God is a title only ever given to God Almighty. It's never a title given to anyone, including Jesus. These, check these four titles. Lord God, God of Gods, the Almighty God, the one true God. These four titles are only ever given to God never to Jesus. So, the Lord God, he doesn't say, and I am also one in the three with him. Your Lord God, the Lord is one. So then he said, to love your neighbour with all your heart and all your soul. So, that's another example for you. And one more quick thing, I want you to reflect, your intelligent person, check. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. It's a verse I love to speak about, and it should make you reflect as well. A rich young man, do you know the story? You have to explain it. Okay, let me, you probably, you, you can recollect Maybe it. Maybe I will. Yeah, okay. It's in Mark chapter 10. A rich young man, he runs up to Jesus and he says to him, Good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? Jesus says to him, Why do you call me good? There's no one good except for only God alone. So he's deferring the title of goodness from himself and giving it to God alone. I'll repeat that again slowly. A rich young man, he runs up to Jesus, he goes, Teach, good teacher, notice the words he's using. Good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? How do I get the hereafter? Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's no one good except for only God alone. So he's deferring the title from himself and giving it to God. Hence, by definition, he can't be God. Well, the, the Bible says otherwise though. It does say that the Holy Trinity is God, the Holy Spirit, and the Son of God. And it also says that Jesus is the Son of God that sits on the right hand of the Father. So when it says the right hand of the Father, like you said, you said that Adam could be a son, you said that anyone could be a son, a messenger for God. But why is it that Jesus is sat on the right hand of the Father and not Adam? Because he is God's right hand man to those whom he was sent off. So basically speaking, if you sit on the right hand of God, it's a common way of expressing that that person is God's right hand man. And why it's, not his son? So the t I've already explained to you, the title son, it's a widespread title in the language used for those who represent God. So when someone is referred to as the Son of God, you might have also automatically assume that he's literally a God's son, but rather one who represents God. Remember I told you the definitions of this term? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And hence, other people are referred to as sons of God, like Adam is referred to as the Son of God in the Bible. Does that literally make him Son of God, like Jesus? No. It just means one who represents God. That's it. So I repeat that again. So when you say when you say once more, oh, but Jesus is Son of God, but it simply means one who represents God according to the biblical terminology. It carries no divine connotation. Now the term God the Son. Look at the subtle difference. Son of God, God the Son. Different terms. The, the term God the Son was later used for Christ much after the, the New Testament was written to describe him as being the second person of the Trinity. But this is not in the Bible. So the title God the Son, notice my words carefully, the title God the Son is not to be found of Jesus in the Bible. So therefore, what we say is again, let Jesus speak for himself. In Mark chapter 6 verse 4, Jesus says the following, that he's referring to himself as a prophet. Muslims say Jesus is a prophet. And Jesus expressly refers to himself as a prophet in so many instances. Mark chapter 6 verse 4, Matthew 21 11, John 6 14, Luke chapter 7 verse 16. He's a prophet. He expressly says it from his blessed mouth. He doesn't go around the streets of Bethlehem or Galilee or Jerusalem saying he's the almighty God. Rather he's inviting you to worship God alone. Why do you call me good? There's no one good except for God alone. What do you think? I think that's very interesting, like how different parts of the Bible can be depicted, depicted in different like, ways. Because the way I would read it is like, he's the son of God, so that's my Lord and my Saviour. Yes. And like, it all comes in three, but the way you've explained it in your way, where it's like, 
he's a prophet, he's a messenger, a lot of people are messengers, and I get that. But I also still believe, like, the son of God, I get what you mean though, I get, you've explained your part. But see, even when I, I thought, I hope I've explained nicely the term yeah. Lord and Saviour, because yeah. in the back of your mind, you're, it's like a pre-assumption, okay, he's my, but you, you've got to think about what does this mean? So a Lord is a title given for many people as well. Mm -hmm. It just means an exalted person. We've already yeah. discussed, you get the house of lords, yeah. those fuddy duddies, old people sitting yeah. with their wigs. Yeah. Are they literally lords? No, they're just people who are given that title. Are, are you finding what I'm saying? Yeah, because they're, they are very important people. So they give a type of Lord and the saviour, as I made mention, there are other saviours. So the title Lord and saviour simply means an exalted person who is save, coming to save his community because he's there as a warner to them. To, for, for them to abstain from the evil that they have become in gripped with. So because Jesus came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, they were, why does it say lost sheep specifically? It's because they'd gone totally away from worshipping God alone. So where worship and closeness and consideration of God should have been prevalent outside the Temple of Solomon, we had gambling. Imagine gambling. Yeah, crazy. So he came amongst them to redeem them, use, bring them back. That's why he says, I have only come for them. He hasn't come for me, he hasn't come for you, just amongst those people. When he said, I have only come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So hence, in conclusion, and I hope you, I mean, so now you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be now saying, well, you know, son of God, and I still see him as a son of God. I've explained that to you what that means. Literally means one who represents God. That's a title. And evidence of that there are many other people with that specific title so based upon these points what we say as muslims is god is not a man he's not a woman he's not an idol he's not a statue nothing is like god in creation he begets not neither is he begotten he's the supreme creator in the bible it says in 1 Kings chapter 8 the heavens and the earth they cannot contain god much less the temple so what we said, the Almighty God, the creator of everything, He's the one solely worthy of worship. Worship Him and Him alone. Give no imagery to Him. Of that Lord in the Genesis, make no image. Precisely. Make no, because the moment you give imagery to God, then God, furthermore to this, couple of points. In Numbers 23, 19, and Hosea 11, 9, expressly states that God is not a man. We know Jesus came as a man. The Greek word is anthropos, which means in John chapter 8, verse 41, when he says to his um, um, opponents, I am a man who has been sent to you by God, yet you are determined to kill me. He never said, I am God who has been sent by God to, to um, you know, to. to yeah, because, because he represents God. Not, he said, I am a man who has been sent by God. So those amongst the, his enemies who, don't, who do not want him yeah. to, do you know, precisely, yes, to who's, who's the Messiah, foretold person to come to redeem the Jews, they're happy in their corruption, they're pocketing nice money, whilst all these illegal activities are taking yeah. place. So that, that's why he calls them, you hypocrites and you vipers. So because he came to expose them, they became his enemies. And then they tried to do away with him. So, again, I want you to reflect upon this point. I'm not making anything up, you see. So again, when Jesus says that you are the only true God, I'm your messenger. Why do you call me good? There's no one good except for God alone. Just imagine I said to you, no, you're a very good person, but you're humbling yourself to say, you know what, in the, in the grand scheme of things, a, a third person. So you're humbling, you're making sure that you understand in the grand scheme of things, only God is good alone. So any, for example, if I'm doing some good work, as a Muslim, I should be saying, Alhamdulillah, all praise to Allah. It's not of my own volition that I'm doing it because of the mercy God has bestowed upon me. So in that context as well, you see. So I want you to reflect upon one thing. In your thinking process, does it make sense that the almighty God can be a man? Because immediately you should ask, well, why doesn't he come as a woman? What is this discrimination against women? Why does he have to be a man for? I don't think of it as that, because I've also read that, I forgot what Bible verse or what chapter it was, but it basically said that God sent him basically himself in human form, in flesh form, in the same form as a human being like you and I, so that we basically know how to serve him or know. Like, I don't I forgot where it was, but God sent 
himself in human form. After Jesus said, um, Jesus rose again from the dead, he also said, I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit which is also a form that Christians refer to yeah. and that Christians like listen to or like when people say that they get conviction, it's the Holy Spirit. So for God to say, I'm sending myself in a, sp in, a, in a form of a man with flesh and blood like you and I, it makes sense to me. Because he didn't say it to Adam. He didn't say it to me. But he, I don't see, it so, with due respect, what you've just said, I don't recall that in, in the Bible I anyway. Please do, I'd love for you to. If you need to, if you need um, like to use my phone, I'm hoping I'll, I'll, oh, okay, I'll yeah. put it back. Okay. Go for it. Nazam, Nazam, Nazam. I want to bring my little friend, my friend, into this little, if you don't mind, into this conversation as well. It's very knowledgeable. Okay, but but yeah, I know, but it's good to see because you're learning something new. Yeah. This is my friend Nazam. So, hi, hi there. Nice to meet you. Okay, so he's going to perhaps we'll give you the one this morning. Okay. So she's got, the lady's going to give some evidence where she feels that Jesus, uh, where God rather says that he's coming in the human form as oh, an expression okay. of, 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 who, of, of, of uh, through Jesus, as the expression of God through the human form. Oh, okay. It's becoming very windy. <laughs> Are you thinking of John 1, you know, the prologue of John? No. I think she may be thinking flesh or something like I that. I think she or? may be thinking of 2 Philippians 5 to 11, although existing in the form of God. No, it was one that I read, like, literally the beginning of this year. And what I studied was, like, I think it would either be in Ecclesiastes, Ephesians, Ephesians. I forgot, but okay. I have to try and find it. Yeah, please do. We're do you really remember interested. the meaning of it? It basically said that in order for God to basically like know how it was, he sent himself in human form with flesh and blood in a form of a human, which was Jesus. Oh, is that maybe uh, 1, 1 Timothy 3.16? That God manifest in the flesh or something like that. Oh yes, in God, yes. Let's have a check about that. I think that's the one Timothy three sixteen in the God here. Yeah, but that's only um, that's not the specific. I don't think you should refer to that specifically. But that's the only. I think the KJV is the only version which is translated yeah, it. King, King James. Yeah, yeah. It's but, to do yeah, with but let's see what the, uh, the peasant lady brings up. I think you could use mine. Very well. You're very welcome to use it. Let me just. That's a pleasure. In fact, let me bring the verse, see if this is the correct one first of all. I'll try it as fast as possible, and then if it's not the right one, then you can explore it further. Which one, Nizam, did you say? Uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, Proclaimed amongst the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Are you, is that what you're referring to? No, I read it in NIV, New International Version. Okay. okay. Which yeah. translation? Uh, no problem at all. But I don't know if it's that verse. Yeah, the NIV doesn't translate it as. But let me, let me just check. If it's not, then you can. You're free to bring up your own one. So it's basically speaking, the same. I think. Um, beyond all question, the mystery from which the godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels was preached among the nations, was believed on the world, and was taken up to heaven. Yeah. Let me check the Bible out. So yeah, please do, yes, please. Um, there it is, as well. I've got it from there. God was manifest. So this is from the King James, God yeah. was manifest in the flesh. But, but it doesn't say that here, does it? In, no, in the NIV it's... Um, he appeared, he in, appeared the, in the flesh, than yes. God was Do you do uh, Bible studies regularly or? Um, not necessarily. 
Hmm. I didn't do Bible studies regularly, but I did like try to start studying my word and stuff. I do read my Bible. Okay, excellent. This is yeah. a good opportunity for you to reflect upon some of the points that I made. But please, yeah, I mean, just yeah. check it out. Was it 1 John 4 2? Yeah, this is it. One, okay, excellent. Let's bring it up. In the, from the NIV, yes? Um, yeah, it can be anywhere. 1 John chapter 4. So, which verse are you referring to? Um, 2. Verse 2, okay. Verse 2. Come on, wake up, wake up. 1 John chapter 4 verse 2 Yes uh, By this you know the Spirit of God Every spirit that professes that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God Yeah, I was familiar with this word, yeah Yeah, yeah, we know this word. Yeah, but this just simply means It's actually the opposite It's actually the opposite of maybe what you're concluding Read it, can you read it, just read it out yourself loudly So you understand our perspective on this verse Yeah, go ahead, Nassim, you want to show it to the lady? Um, by this you know the spirit. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus, oh. sorry, Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is from God. Yeah. Is from God. So what it's saying that it's not saying that Jesus is God in yeah. this form of spirit. But he's a man. <laughs> he's a human. Yeah. So the, the spirit that denies that Jesus is a man or is from flesh uh, is, isn't from God. But the spirit that affirms that he is a man is from God. So we say he's a man, he's a human. Yeah, okay. I don't know if that's a specific one, but I can't find it. But you, you understand? I mean, even yeah, though, okay, that's fine. No, that's fine. I mean, if you can't find it, maybe next time. But I hope this has laid clear that if, if, you, if this was perhaps what you were thinking initially, then it's not ref referencing Jesus as God. As a Nazar You want to explain once more for her attention? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's referring to those people that deny that Jesus is a human mm -hmm. or is in the flesh. Come in the flesh. It's hu yeah. Humans come in the flesh, don't they? Yeah. yeah. Whereas, um, yeah, so it, it's basically, you know, like in early Christianity, mm -hmm. um, you had different like groups of Christians, like different churches. Like even nowadays, you know, you have like the Jehovah's Witnesses yeah, and, like, and this and that. So, um, this is referring to those Christians that deny that Jesus was a man. Okay, it might actually be, sorry. So, that's fine. Oh, it no, might actually cool, be the yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, then it's the King James Bible that says, God was manifest in the flesh. Mm -hmm. But in your so, one, the anyway, NIV, yeah. it says he was manifest in the flesh. It doesn't say God was manifest in the flesh. So if your argument is that Jesus referred to as God, within 1 Timothy 3.16, in the KJV it has it, but not in the NIV. Or and ESV or... Yeah. Because... Uh, it's to do with textual manuscripts, um, manuscript variants. So you know in the ancient world when people wanted to make a copy of a book, they would have to manually copy it. Um, so as a result, you have like man-made like, copy mistakes, copy errors. So King James is based upon later manuscripts, where there's more early manuscripts that were discovered, and in the early ones it doesn't have God was manifest. Is NIV earlier? Yeah, okay. NIV is based upon earlier than the King so they're, James. Yeah. They're the earlier, so you know the KJV, yeah. they take their like manuscripts or, or their translation from a later 11th century document, if I'm not mistaken, which is the text, sure, yeah, yeah, I think it's the Textus right. Receptus, Textus Receptus yeah, which was yeah. then modified into the um, 16th century by King James. Okay. So hence you've got the King James Bible. Yeah. But the ones you read, yeah. did you know that Bible wasn't in circulation going back about 70, 80 years ago, the NIV. <coughs> but the reason why this Bible came into circulation was because Christian scholars realized that the, the KJV doesn't go back to the earliest Greek manuscripts. 
So what they then did, they went back to the NIV and other such versions. They then went back to the earliest manuscripts which were available, the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus. Those manuscripts are currently available for people to view in the British Museum in central London. So that is why the NIV came out. But so in the NIV, it doesn't say uh, God was manifest in the flesh. It rather says He was manifest. So it wasn't. It, it doesn't reference Jesus as God there. You know, in the British Library has got the oldest Bible in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Have you Have you been? Yeah, I've heard yeah. Of that, yeah. So yeah, in that it says He was manifest, not God was manifest. Yeah. And last year, like with um, John three sixteen, where it says. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, only begotten son, that he never worshipped him. But the bit where it says the only begotten son, why does it say only? Like the one and only son, when there's like multiple sons that he said, or like multiple people that he refers to the sons, and multiple people that he refers to the sons. So the New Testament's a valuable document in that it tells us. Um, it gives us a window into early Christianity and how Christian doctrines like developed over time. So nowadays when we say Son of God, we automatically think of just one Son of God and that's Jesus. Uh, but if you go to the Bible, like in the Old Testament, there's many Sons of God. And in the first three Gospels, there's also many Sons of God. Like Adam is referred to as the Son of God. Um, the peacemakers, they're referred to as the sons of God. And of course, Jesus is also called the son of God. But in John's gospel, John is regarded as being the last gospel to be written from the four. So John reflects his later understanding where Jesus becomes the unique son of God, the one and only son of God. So, you know, the gospels, they were not all written at once, but they were written like in different periods. So John's written towards the end of the first century. And by that time, Christians are already beginning to like develop and think of Jesus as the kind of unique, special Son of God. So in John, Jesus is the only one that is called the Son of God, whereas other people are referred to as the children of God, but not the sons of God. Yeah. Whereas in the other Gospels, it says, "Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the, for they shall be called the sons of God." Or uh, as many that are led by the Spirit. Uh, I've already also the Romans chapter of 8. Yeah. I've already That's mentioned Paul, that remember, yeah, earlier yeah, when I defined yeah. the two definitions. And Paul of was of God. written before the Gospels. So Paul is even earlier. So, Son of God was a title that was used for others, but it becomes a special title for Jesus later on in Christianity. So, it's and due with the development of the And furthermore, in that John 3 16 passage, yeah. when it says, God so ever loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the Greek word there is a Greek word called meno monogenes. Yeah. It literally means unique, meaning in the sense that he was born in a unique way. It's not saying that he's only son which of God. It says it's the only one who is born in a unique way, which is the virgin birth. Yeah. So it's in that context he's referred to as unique. Not that he's the only literal begotten son of God. Just that he was given a special privilege where he was born in a miraculous way without the, the, the conduit of a father. It's just like in the Old Testament when, when, um, when the angel gives um, Abraham glad tidings that his wife, Sarah, is going to give birth to an elderly. And he says, how can my wife give birth when she is elderly and barren? Not only was she old, like 90 years of age, but she was also unable to conceive. But when God says in the Bible, when I simply will something, I say be and it is. So that's a big miracle in itself, isn't it? Imagine today a 90-year-old woman who is known to be barren, I mean, he can't give birth, and she gives birth to a son. That's a miracle, isn't it? Huge miracle. So in that sense as well, you see, we're understanding that God gave a special, bestowed a special favour upon to um, uh, Mary, mother of Jesus, which is ratified in the Quran. Yes, sorry. No, no, I'll okay. Yeah, that's Mary, all, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, also sorry, ratified yeah, yeah. in the Quran as well. Yeah. Where, but Allah says that when the angel gives glad tidings to Mary that she will give birth to a child, she exclaims to the to um, to the angel, "But how can I have a child when no man has touched me?" And the Quran beautifully says, "But angel Gabriel replies to Mary by saying, when God simply wills something, He says, be and it is." So it's a special favour bestowed upon to her. Now, having discussed this in depth, I hope you've got some sort of understanding now 
that in our understanding, there's some people you'd like to add on. What I mean, do you believe that there's even the remote possibility that the Bible is preaching that Jesus is God in, in the same sense of God the Father? Um, there's no explicit verse that calls Jesus God, like in an ontological sense. Exactly, thank you. Uh, so the Lord commonly refers to God, but is also shared with other people, like kings are referred to as Lord, like David is called Lord in 1 Kings chapter 1. Um, Abraham is called Lord by Sarah um, in 1 Peter, I think it's chapter 3, verse 6. Uh, Abraham calls, uh, so Sarah calls Abraham, Abraham her Lord. My, my Lord. So you have shared titles and also the title God is also like used for Moses, uh, like Exodus 7 1. Um, Solomon is called Elohim as well in Psalms 46. Verse 5. Uh, Psalms chapter 45, verse 6 to 7. 45, verse 6. And um, Elohim, angels are called Elohim in Psalms. And also the judges are called Elohim. And of course, God in Genesis 1 1 is called uh, Elohim. Um, so you have shared titles, but it doesn't mean they share the same identity. So, for example, very uh, yeah, briefly, sorry. sorry very briefly, you know, for yeah. example, the title King of Kings, which is often given to Jesus but, and given to God. And one yeah, would assume, yeah. okay, if that's a title given to Jesus and to God, that's suggesting something which is Jesus must be God. But did you know there are other people who are referred to with that title as well? So in Ezra chapter 7 verse 12, King Artaxius, he's referred to as King of Kings. Doesn't make him God though, does it? Or in Daniel chapter 2 verse 46, where King Nebuchadnezzar worships oh, Daniel. Yeah. I do not. Arch Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. It's called and King of Kings or Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Oh I didn't know. That's that. in Daniel chapter 2 verse 46. Oh, okay. So Essentially speaking, it doesn't mean you a title given to God and to Jesus, and this must make... They on the, share the same identity. Yeah, yeah. share the same identity. But on the, on the face of it, I wouldn't blame you thinking like that, because the English can be somewhat misleading. So when we described the title Lord and Saviour to the nice young lady, I explained, I broke it down by referencing the term that the fact that Lord means simply one, as explained twice now, an exalted person, like in 1 Corinthians 8 verses 4 oh. to 6. Remember I told you at the beginning where Paul is distinguishing, meaning separating the title by saying that God the Father is the one from whom all things come. There is one God, the Father. He's not saying there's one God which is Jesus and the Father. And then when he says there's one Lord Jesus Christ, meaning that, that the exalted human being through the reason that God makes creation. So the Bible writers were of the opinion that the Almighty God, he has got a plan in mind. And that plan is to create human beings who are referred to as custodians of over creation, <coughs> referred to as Lord of over creation. So God has given us human beings absolute special privileges, even beyond angels. So is it within that context that God in his future planning, in his future wisdom, is going to send, select representatives who will represent God, one of which is Jesus. And for, it's for these people's sake, and the Bible writers for, in particular for the sake of Jesus, that God creates everything, not that Jesus is the active participant within the creation. Mm -hmm. Is that unless a bit of a mouthful, but I hope you've had a chance to understand. So in, in essence, what I want you to reflect on, on today and our conversation, you can perhaps this evening when you go back home and you've rested up, watch our discussion, which we've had, and reflect on some of the points. I know it can be quite absorbing in terms of the information given, but I'll, once I've just um, concluded speaking here with you, which I, I don't want to keep you, keep you very, very, very patiently. for I'm very intrigued. Super. So you can reflect upon it. I'll give you the names of the channels very shortly. Go home tonight, watch it. When whoever loads it up first between them, you can just uh, subscribe to each of the channels and it, we can, you can reflect. It will go on YouTube tonight as well. Okay? So let me just make a finishing comment over here. And then if you want to add anything else, you would like to add anything? No, we're here every Saturday. So if you want any more further questions, uh, we'll come. We're here from about 2 o'clock to... Yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to say, like, a lot of these things that are said in the Bible, a lot of these things that are said in different religions, in a way, like, we're trying to understand it. And I feel like sometimes certain things can't be fully understood when it's coming from God, because obviously, as humans, we're, not, we're never going to be able to think about it. So we can't think of in the same way God thinks, or in the same way, like, God has made things to be. So now that we're actually on a human level, 
I don't think that we can fully understand everything that's being said. Like everything in the Bible, it's like if you have that faith, if you've been through something and God has been able to save you, or you feel like God has saved you, then fair enough you can stick to that faith. And you feel like if you feel like Allah has saved you, you fair enough you can stick to that faith. Doesn't mean that every single thing in the Quran or every single thing in the Bible is meant to be understood. But because that faith is something that you have, that's why you actually stick to that religion if that makes sense. Yes, yeah, it's a very good point you've raised, but just remember one thing. Yeah. Like in the Bible it says God is not the author of confusion. Mm -hmm. So therefore your belief has to be supplemented by what you read. You take out the belief from what you're reading. So as a result of that, for example, that self-explanatory statements which I made mention, the brothers made mention like in John 17, 3, where you are the only true God and I'm your messenger whom you have sent. There's no different ways of explaining this. In English, that's clear. He's referring to somebody else as you are the only true God and I'm your messenger. So even though you can feel certain spiritual contact with how you feel you're reading such a text, but when something becomes self-explanatory, then it's something for you to reflect and think, you know what, maybe I've got to alter my position somewhat. Now, in the Islamic paradigm, we believe that if you accept, if you understand Islam, and I'd like to give you a gift as a parting gesture, a free copy of the Quran in English. Sorry, there you go. That's a free copy. Delighted. That's the very least we could do. So, in our paradigm, if you if you get to know the Islamic perspective, we believe you do not lose Jesus Christ. You gain him. He's a very fundamental person within our religion as well. Are you aware of this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's mentioned actually 25 times by name in the Quran. In addition. There's a whole chapter devoted to his mother, Mary. It's called Surah Maryam. She's held in the highest of esteem, as is Jesus. So Muslims, no Muslim on the face of this earth would ever dare say anything critical of Jesus. Ever. Because we hold him in massive esteem. He's amongst the greatest messengers. What we say, there was one final messenger to come, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who, to, who also was simply a messenger. No more, no less. He's got no share or claim to being God. Only there's only one true God. And that was the overwhelming message of Islam. You worship God alone. Don't associate partners with that creator. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. Excellent. So I hope you've had a few things to really reflect upon. I'm just going to summarize very briefly, unless you want to ask anything else before. No, no, no. Okay, super. I'm just going to very quickly pause over here, reflect. I just, it should be my, no more than 30 seconds. And then I'll share the channel's names with you. You can have a, a, a view of the discussion that we've had. Just give me one moment, please. Thank you. So a delightful conversation with a very, very pleasant young lady who is in, in a process of investigating the Bible. She's a Bible reader, perhaps not avid, but she's investigating the scriptures to a certain extent. And what we're observing essentially is that she found some of the information very informative. Perhaps when she goes back this evening and she watches this discussion upon the channels, that she will have a chance to, inshallah, to reflect to understand and to really consider the points. As I made mention, we're here every Saturday between 2 p.m. onwards. And um, of course, you'd be delighted to return again. So may Allah guide her, may Allah guide us, make, Allah, make us also good representatives of his, of his religion. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.